Anthony, Dan, thank you so much for being with, here, with us here today. We're really looking forward to this presentation and I'm gonna go ahead and give the floor to you guys. Great, thanks, Jay, really appreciate it. Hey, listen, uh, you know, I, I, we're very pleased to give this presentation. I've, I've attended each one of the, uh, the industry hour presentations since the beginning of the year. There's been about three or four of them. And I personally have walked away from each one of them learning something new or uh, having, ha you know, seeing something in a different light than I had understood before. So it's a huge practical advantage. And, and I thank you, Jay, for putting it together. And I'm hoping that the participants of today's presentation have a similar experience when they walk away from this one. Uh, look, uh, I'm, I'm Tony Byler. I'm a construction lawyer uh, in the construction group at Cohen Seglius. I'm joined today by Dan Fierstein, uh, my law partner. You could say hi, Dan. Hey, how's it going, guys? Uh, you know, you know, Dan and I represent uh, contractors as well as owners and suppliers uh, throughout the U.S. We're involved in many chapters of NECA. Uh, we have the, the pleasure and opportunity to represent many contractors like uh, you. Uh, and, and sometimes they're small stakes uh, litigation, sometimes they're very high stakes litigation. I'm working on a $23 million uh, combined cycle power plant right now in, in the Midwest uh, to put things in context. But in what Dan and I have done as we've worked with teams uh, such as those, uh, your offices, uh, in putting together either a defense or prosecuting claims uh, when those come along, and they do come along, We've had an opportunity to take a look at uh, the superintendents, the project managers, the supervision on these teams, and we've gotten a good sense as to what, what traits, what characteristics among supers and project managers allow them to accelerate and, and, to, and to move up through the ranks uh, within their companies, and those that are very effective in helping us successfully resolve claims. Uh, so what Dan and I wanted to do is give you um, a presentation on this. Uh, we're really going to be doing two things. We're going to be focusing on those traits that we've observed uh, in good project managers um, and superintendents. Uh, and we're going to talk about those, those traits to ensure that you're looking at them, you're seeing them, you can aspire to them. We'll talk about the, you know, a, a key a construct, a reminder that will help you focusing on those things that are successful. And then we're gonna talk about those things that you should be focusing on um, to help both yourself advance, help your company, protect your company and uh, move up through uh, your ranks. Uh, Dan, if you wanna, if, oh, uh, I, I guess we should say, Dan, you wanna talk about people who, who wanna chime in if they have questions? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I think you heard from, from Jay, um, you can either put your questions in the chat bucket, but Tony and I very much welcome interruptions. Um, so that you can cut off our droning a little bit um, and make it interactive. Um, so don't be bashful about that. Um, and you know, just to to piggyback onto what Tony's saying, Tony, I do. I'm a copy and paste of Tony. Essentially, um, we we handle the same type of work, same types of projects and clients. Um, so um, you know, if there's there's a couple of themes to take away from here. One of them is going to be as project managers and supervisors, the more you can put in a little bit of extra time, a little bit of extra effort and investment now during the project, you're going to end up protecting that profit that you so carefully estimated. And you're probably gonna have to spend a lot less time after the project dealing with suits like Tony and I, because you've already protected the project record. So without further ado, uh, Tony, why don't you uh, take it away? Um, I, I guess we have the inevitable uh, personality cult slide, but let's just skip past that and dive right in. All right, sound, sounds great. Again, you know, my assumption, you know, I've looked at uh, I've looked at some of uh, some of uh, your faces and names as you were signing onto this program, and I know it's a mixed bag. I know that there are some owners out there. Um, and I know that there are some uh, people in the field, uh, some, some supervision. And th these, these slides should appeal to both. Why? Because if you're, if you're a super and you're looking to move up in your, in your organization, you want to emulate and you want to follow these keys. And if you're an owner, you want to encourage your supervisors to emulate these keys. Because look, at the end of the day, you run a successful business you know, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, you're going to want to turn this over to capable people who have moved up the ranks to, for whom you trust and know are doing the right thing. So consider this as ways of distinguishing yourself and moving up through the ranks if you're, if you're in the field. The first key point, and we've got five of them, 
uh, is to start to think like an owner. Let me put this in context. We all know those great supervisors who go out to the project day in and day out. They do the work. They make certain that the work is progressing as intended. They keep things uh, chill in the field. They close it out and they get you to the next one. That's great. You want that. But if, but you need, if you're going to move up in an organization, if you're going to promote somebody who's worthy, you need to think beyond that. What you need to start doing is start thinking like an owner. Uh, as, as we sometimes say, you got to put the big boy pants on. You got to start thinking in the context of what makes a company successful. And the, and the easiest formula to explain about success is profit. Revenue minus costs equals profit. And we're in this business to make profit. I mean, to do good work as well, but profit is the objective. So whatever you can do to increase revenue, that'll help increase profit. Anything that you can do to decrease costs, whether it's finding uh, less expensive material, whether it's ensuring that material gets to the project in a more efficient way, uh, you know, anything that you can do that will, that will go to the bottom line, that will result in greater profits is something, if you can do it and you show a, 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 a sensitivity to it and you talk about it, um, you're going to be putting your position to distinguish yourself from others and you will more likely move up the ranks. We can advance to the next one. All right, let's talk about the, the pre-construction turnover handoff meeting. This is essential. And let me tell you why this is essential. And I don't know, every organization has a different way of, of getting uh, the information that was put together by the estimating team into the hands of the team that's going to run the project once the award comes in. Uh, I can't even generalize how this is generally done because there are so many different ways of handing this off. Let me tell you the worst way to do this. Uh, and a, an estimating team does its estimates um, doesn't keep its takeoffs, doesn't keep its, its manpower loading if they did curves, uh, or they put it in a file. And then later, someone else is called up as a project management team is told, we've got to start on X, X day. If you want to take a look at the file, whatever we have, go to subfolder on the computer. That's a horrific scenario. And why is that a horrific scenario? Because let's go back to the idea of revenue minus cost equals profit. It, when the estimators or the estimating team put this together, they had certain assumptions. They had an assumption about what's the length of time we're going to have. Do we have a hard stop? Do we have a hard stop? How are we going to ramp up our labor on this project? What are our material costs going to be? What would the consequence be if we, if we have a late delivery of a long lead item? Those are all going to impact the value that the estimating team ascribed to this project. And unless the project team, the supervisors know those assumptions, they're going to be operating in a in a vacuum, and they can get side and they can get sidetracked. So it's important, it's fundamentally important, for the estimating team to have a meeting, face to face if it can be virtual, and go over these are the assumptions that we made. This is what we need to do. These are what we plan for, and have have both groups talk, and then implement that. Absent that, we see so many problems coming from that ground start, even before the the first boot is put on the field. There's a, there's a loss of the ability to maximize profit. We can go to the next slide. All right, this boot tails, or this, this dovetails, I should say, right into the last slide. Once you have, once you have an estimating team who's come up with certain quantities on their takeoffs, whether it's materials, whether it's rate of installation, whether it's labor, those need to be tracked on a periodic basis by the project team. Why? Well, because if, you, if you're starting to uh, employ labor at a greater rate than you anticipated, your estimating team did early on in the project, that means you might be accelerating. It might mean that you're doing things out of sequence. It may, might mean that somebody is responsible or you're responsible for things that are going wrong. So you need to be able on a periodic basis. We say monthly. I think some of the best companies do this weekly. Uh, and they'll sit down and they'll take a look at where are we supposed to be this week on our manpower curve? Are we ahead? Or are we behind? Why are we ahead? Why are we behind? Are our costs on track? Are we ahead? Or are we behind? This way, it will signal something. If something's not right, if it's going beyond the expectation, perhaps for the wrong, it'll trigger uh, the need and the thought for your project team to discuss it and find a solution, figure out what's causing it and fix it. Let's go to the next slide. Fourth key step. Um, and this is an easy way to, to, uh, to encapsulate this step is, 
you have to manage the politics uh, around you. Uh, and people who succeed appreciate the politics, appreciate the culture that they're working within and find ways to assimilate with that. Not every company is the same when it comes to the way that they obtain profit, the way that they consider claims and whether claims and pursuit of claims is a part of the business model. Uh, I represent, and Dan represents, a ton of people who are old school. A handshake should suffice. If there's a problem, we're going to fix it. We're going to, I'm going to give you money. You're going to give me money. At the end of the day, we're going to go to the next one and it's going to be fine. It's the old school way. It works frequently. It's, uh, it's romantic. It, when it works, it's fantastic. Uh, it doesn't always work and it's not the best plan. And some people realize that. And some people say, look, we're going to go by the book. The contract says this, we're going to do this on this date. We're going to entitle ourselves to this. And if we don't get it, we're going to claim and we're going to pursue that money. You have to know in which environment you are. And let me put this in context. I didn't discuss this with Dan. I had a conversation with the project manager on a big case this last week. And he said, I remember when your firm came through and you gave a presentation and you gave us some forms and told us how to use these forms and get ahead of these issues. And man, I printed out that form, filled it out and sent it out. And within a day, the owner of my company came at me and was screaming at me for sending out that letter. And I said, why do you scream at you? He goes, because he didn't think that it was appropriate for us to start protecting our interests and getting on the edge of this and preserving our claims. He wanted to have a different tack. And I said, well, you know, we have a slide that we address now. We may not have had it a decade ago to say, you got to keep this in mind. You got to work within the confines of your company. Uh, if it, you, you may advance in your company because your, your philosophical beliefs are aligned with your companies, it may not, and you may need to go someplace else. But if you want to succeed within the company that you're in, you have to know the, 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 the culture and you have to respect that culture. Let's go to the next one, Dan. All right, fifth key. Um, and this was a little bit more nebulous, but it's profoundly important. Um, you got to start, it, one, one of the things is you have to start thinking like an owner. And what does an owner do? Well, an owner surrounds himself or herself with a team of advisors. Um, you know, your company probably has uh, a, a CPA, uh, an accountant. Your company probably has someone who provides IT uh, communications, has a lawyer, uh, has, has someone who provides uh, software for project management. Um, you need to know those people. You need to know those systems. You should be talking to them, one, to become an expert in those, in those various issues, but two, to know what, the whole, what, what to expect from these providers. You should go to trade association events like this one for NECA. You're gonna meet these people. You're gonna meet CPAs. You're gonna meet other attorneys and you should talk to them because they may have a little bit of a, a different spin or they may reinforce what you're already hearing. As you start to collaborate with professionals, Again, you're making yourself, you're, you're starting to take steps that an owner does. You're getting good advice. You're going you're gonna to hear something at a presentation like you're doing right now, and you're going to roll it out in the field, and it's going to make a significant difference, and it's going to give you a golden star and an opportunity to shine. So do that. Don't hesitate to start doing it. So we've talked about five key things. These are, these are anecdotal, right? They're little things that you can pick out. But I want to talk about, oh, yeah, I want to give you a... a, 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 a an, uh, an, a, a, a simple mnemonic device, a way of remembering what is important and break it down into three key things. And what is, what, what is it, why don't you float this? What I want you to think of is FAC, F-A-C. I'm doing this for a reason, this is a mnemonic device because it's you know, a little shameful and a little guilty on my, on my behalf. Here's the deal, if you wanna succeed, you need to give a FAC, all right? It's as simple as that. So let's figure out what FAC is broken into. F is focus, right? Here's, here's what we're talking about in terms of focus. Dan and I are going to give you some ideas. We're going to give you some, some real life examples, uh, some legal issues that come up on every project. And when you hear these, now that you've gone through this presentation, when you hear about these things, we need you to focus in on that when it happens in the field. For example, we're going to talk about change orders. We're going to talk about uh, uh, adjustments in the field. When you hear about that, you have to realize those could impact the bottom line. And you can't just brush it off and say, oh, yeah, I remember that it gives a rise to change order. You got to focus on it. What is this? Why is it a change? What impact is it going to have on your company? Let's go to the second item, which is action. Right? How many times you say, oh, you know, the guy had good intentions. Oh, you know, I really wanted to go down and spend you know, five hours at the food bank doing the right thing, but, you know, I forgot about it. Good intentions and being able to focus on things is not going to help your company. It's not going to help you. You need to put it in action. So when you hear about an opportunity for a change order that might hurt you or help you, 
You need to focus on it, and then you need to take action. And with, and consistent with your company's culture, so you need to you need to start providing notices. You start you need to start providing daily reports or daily notices about the impact. You have to act in order for these things to uh, happen and for you to protect the company. Let's go to the C, the third thing, care. Uh, if you've heard care, you may have heard it in the first presenter uh, who in this series who talked about a gentleman who stood up at a at a um, at a um, a, 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 a motivational uh, seminar and said, you want me to give you something motivational? I'll tell you what it is. Care, effing care, dropped the mic and left. I could have started with care. And in fact, I probably should have started with care because unless you care about your future, unless you care about your company, unless you care about becoming the next owner of your company, or perhaps an owner in, in, in with, with others uh, in that company or at another company, you're not going to have the motivation to focus. You're not going to have the motivation to take action. But if I started this with care at the beginning, it would be CFA and it would look like certified financial advisor or something like that. Not nearly as fun and is, and is out there as FAC. So again, if you want to advance everybody, what do you have to do? You got to give a right. All right, right. Uh, now that I sound like a, like a, a crude uh, Bostonian, I'm going to hand it over to Dan, who spent three years of his law school career surrounded by crude Bostonians. Um, I, think, ahead, I think, Tony, at this point, everybody is ready to tell you to go fact yourself. <laughs> um, but so, so let me take it from here. Um, everything that you just heard from Tony, um, it's all about excellent project management from start to finish. And that's a pretty... That's that's a vague platitude. You know what does that really mean? Um, it, it means going the extra mile. It means staying in there for for that that extra few minutes, responding to that last email, that last letter that put you on notice that you're causing delays that you know that you didn't cause, and responding, even if it's an email. Um, it's about being hyper vigilant because what what Tony and I. Uh, try to teach uh, project managers and supervisors and owners alike is that you're really, you are our first line of offense and defense. Tony and I come in at the end, typically, the project is done, the die is cast, the facts are set. All we're doing from our, you know, cheap seats, our little ivory tower, as we pick apart the project record is finding ways to fit fit what you've done and the project record that you've created into the terms of the contract so that we can develop legal arguments that entitle you to, to money if we're bringing the claim or a defense if you're trying to um, refute the claim. So you really are kind of many lawyers or paralegals on the ground, like it or not. Um, that's the reality of, of project management in 2021. It doesn't mean you have to write a novel, uh, but it does mean that you have to be hyper vigilant and you have to be thinking about how do I outwork my project manager counterpart on the other side. So if you're a competitive lunatic like I am, treat it like a game, outwork, win, right? Our glory days of sports are over. So the wins are, you know, the competitive wins are hard to find. We're not athletes. Um, so so make this your, your field of play um, because I think that's a good way of looking at it um, in some respects. And adaptability. Um, everybody knows that the, the project you end up with will never be quite the exact same as the project um, that, that, you, that you end up managing. So be adaptable. Know that, that things aren't going to go exactly as planned. The ground underneath you may not perfectly reflect the geotechnical report. Um, and it's how you react to that and how you adapt to it that's going to define how the project goes for your company. So everybody on, on this in this webinar knows what a change order is, but, but it's helpful to go through it in a little bit more detail because a change order is whatever it says a change order is in your contract. And that's another theme that you're gonna see in this, in this webinar, which is the answer to a lot of your questions are going to be right back in your Bible, right back in the contract. It's going to tell you what a change order is and what you have to do when a change condition comes up. In the most traditional sense, if we if we just use the AIA um, general conditions, it's a written instrument 
It's going to be signed by everybody who's part of it. In the AIA, you know, the default is that you have an owner and a contractor and an architect. So, you know, be careful because if you have a change order or document that says change order on it, but it's defined as a, as a document that requires three signatures and you have two and everybody knows that, that you know, you've got a change, you don't quite have a change order as it's defined in your contract. Now, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that you need to slavishly comply with every single, you know, sentence and definition in the contract, but you do want to think about it because if you don't have all the signatures, you don't have a change order, and what you really have is a dispute, even if no, even if the other side doesn't realize it, it may never come up. You may end up getting to bill for it, put it on your payment application, get paid for it, and you never hear about it again. But sometimes when you think you had a change order and then you're closing out the project at the end and you're trying to get that contract balance, that retainage, you might see them take a different tack with the change order. Oh, you know what? We didn't sign that because we didn't quite have a full agreement as to the amount. Sorry, you're out of luck. And some courts and arbitrators might sympathize with you, but others might strictly construe that provision. And that's where it can become unnecessarily costly towards the end of the project. So again, yeah, 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 let me let me jump in just for a second. Do, sure. uh, let's, here's, here's the reality. Let's put this in context. Let's talk about the consequences to profit. If you have a signed change order and and it's all and it's signed by everybody, it's completely executed, that becomes part of the contract. And if you don't get paid that dollar, so let's say it's a twenty thousand dollar change. If you don't get paid that twenty thousand dollars and you you hire a lawyer, Dan and I we, we put proof in front of the judge. We show this is a signed change order. The other side's got to pay that $20,000, right? Let's say it's not all signed or it's not in the form that your contract requires. What do, you, what do we have to do? Well, now we have to consider getting an expert involved. Why would we need to get an expert involved? Because we have to establish, we have the burden of proving that the work that you did was outside of your contract scope. And sometimes that's going to take an engineer or an architect or an expert in electrical installation the value of your change order could be exceeded by the cost of having to prove it. That's the difference we want to make certain. So when you give thought to trying to tie out these change orders, it's worth every second that you have to make certain that it complies. Well, Anthony, and Dan, um, I think someone has their hand raised. Jim Meyer, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, I'm sure others on this call are um, seeing this and I, I, I know Roy and Dan and you guys are pretty well. Uh, the days of putting change orders on buildings uh, to make sure they're out there are changing because of you know software like Textura and other procure and uh, and other things that that we're not even being able to do that anymore. How are we getting around that when you're getting into the dispute of change orders? It's a great it's a great question, Jim. And um, you know the short answer is it you know. It, if you can't bill for it and you're hampered by the technology, and this is another thing you'll learn from us, there's always one more, at least one more thing you can do, one more letter you can write or email you can send. So, and we'll get to this when we talk about partial releases, but um, if they're not letting you bill for it, then you have a dispute and you have a claim and then you're in a different area of your contract. But when you go in and bill for the month, what you can do is you can send a cover letter, a cover email, say, listen, we'd, li we'd like to bill for this change order. It's, it's an agreed upon change order as we understand it. Um, so we'd like to be able to bill for that. And just to be clear, when we bill, for it, when we bill this month and we sign this partial release, we are not giving up that, that unresolved change order. Um, that's one way of preserving it down the road um, and, and at least, you know, giving Tony and I something down the road in the project record that was written live contemporaneously that's going to allow us to, to beat them back or allow you at the, at the closeout stage um, to, to show them why they're, they're barking up the wrong tree by trying to get out from under the change order. Tony, I don't know if you have a different view on that. 100% the same. Um, you know, the, the great thing about uh, some of this, these electronic billing uh, uh, devices and, and mechanisms is that you get paid more reliably and it goes in neater. The downside is what you just described, Jim. Uh, you document it, 
uh, you, you do you, you have to faithfully document it. And that what you do by doing that, by sending an email or sending a letter is you you deny your customer the ability to ever say, I wasn't aware of that change order. You intended to release that work. You've now created an issue. It gives you an opportunity to, to recover for it. Exactly. Good. Great question, Jim. Um, so just to just to finish up here with the change orders again, obviously, it's a change in the work. Um, we've talked a lot about amounts, but one thing to also consider is that a change order also is, is adjusting time. And more often than not, there's gonna be a big zero where it talks about days changed. And Tony are, and I are going to beat you to death with the importance of, of, of time. Never neglect time because even if you ask for it, knowing that that date isn't going to change, you have positioned yourself extremely well to get around things like no damages for delay. Um, you told me I only get time and not money when the project is delayed. I asked you for time, you said no. Now you're in breach of that provision and the dollars, uh, there's entitlement to dollars. So if you see a time impact, even if you know the answer is gonna be no or it's going to get ignored, ask for it. Put it right here in the change order request. I request 30 days for this scope ad. This is just a, what you see before you is, is just the AIA form change order. You've likely all seen it and it checks all the boxes. Up here, you've got the, the description of the change. The contract sum will be increased or decreased in this amount. And then here's the time. Signature one, signature two, signature three. If you need three signatures, be vigilant and don't stop until you get it. Um, a construction change directive is kind of like the next best thing. It's not a change order for a sum certain or a TNM, but it's like a placeholder. We know that there's a change. Um, we acknowledge that and that you're going to get paid, but for whatever reason, we can't, we can't agree on the price. And this is the AIA definition, written order signed by the, the owner and the architect directing a change and stating the basis for it. Um, but again, the, the time or the money associated with it is going to be dealt with at a later time. Um, so when this happens, it's not a bad thing, but it means you need to start, you need to create that X number in your system and you need to start tracking your costs associated with that particular change. Because if you start commingling everything, and this goes back to tracking costs and, and being vigilant about the project file, it's going to be very difficult to show the customer down the road when it's time to price the change and show them the cost, it's gonna be very difficult to segregate that out. So create the X number, tell your supervisors and have your on the ground superintendent making sure that the labor is actually tracking and coding as best as you can. Um, Right here, you have a form from the AIA. Again, it's very similar to the change order, but you won't see an amount. You're going to see, all right, we're gonna price this based on unit price, if that's doable. More likely scenario is gonna be right here, and it's gonna be cost plus your markup. So this is where you need to track that cost. All right. Tony? Thanks. All right, so you've tried your best. You've seen a change condition in the field. You've tried your best, you've done your best to get your customer, whether it's the owner or a general contractor to compensate you for time and dollars. And they're not willing to do that. You've exhausted every opportunity. You've offered up the construction change directive as an alternative to a change order, that doesn't work. Now you're stuck. You're told to proceed with the work, it's in your scope, you're not getting paid, continue. What do you do? Well, now we're in a position of claim and you've attempted to do everything. Uh, so the question now is, what do you what do you do when you have to bring a claim? How what is a claim? How do you how do you take the next steps? Well, the answer, ninety nine times out of hundred, is spelled out directly in your contract. So that's what we have here. It says, look to your contract. Dan, you want to you want to advance? Yep. Um, your every contract is different. Well, most contracts are different, um, and even AIA form contracts get modified frequently. So you need to go to the section of your contract. You need to look up claims. It's going to tell you what is a claim. And this is just an AIA format. To simplify, it means anything. It means if you want something that you didn't get, you're the you're the you're the you're the little boy who asked for something and you're denied that uh, by by the big bully. It's a claim, and you got to take steps. The contract will tell you what you need to do uh, 
um, how you need to present the claim and the time frame in which you need to present the claim to move forward. So know if you get to the point of claim, look to your contract, consider what it says, follow the instructions. Let's advance to the next slide. Here's, here's the reality, and we all know this. Uh, it's, a, it's a rare contract, it's a rare project that does not present a need or possibility of pursuing a claim. And it can be both offensive, you can, you can be impacted by someone and you aggressively pursue the claim. It could be defensive. You need to take steps to prevent others from blaming you for something. Uh, so it's gonna come up. We don't have the luxury of doing work uh, in an environment that doesn't lead to claims, whether it's by delay del uh, in, in deliveries, uh, issues concerning the quality of products, et cetera. And you don't have control over that, right? You're 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 going to follow. You're, you're going to you're a follow trade. Often, uh, you're at the whim of owner supplied uh, equipment. Oftentimes, you can't you can't control that. Your ability to recover legally, uh, your impacts is on your shoulders. Now, I want to talk about whose shoulders these are. This isn't the shoulders of the owner when these issues come up. Nine times out of ten, the owner has no idea of what's going on. That there's been an impact in the field. It's not the responsibility of the billing department. They don't know either. Responsibility falls squarely on the shoulders of the superintendents and project managers who are sensitive, who have focused in on the issue, hear the issue, know that they need to take a step, have done everything they can to get a change in place. Now it's your job. It's your job to take the next step. And it starts with talking to the owner to ensure that they have, you have clarity. But the burden on demonstrating entitlement is on you. Once you've accepted that, you can then move on and realize that I have to do something. Let's go to the next, the next fly-in. So what do you do? What do you do to substantiate your claim? You're going to keep good project records. You're going to keep best practices. You're going to have good computer files. You're going to have your dailies going to a certain location. You're going to be maintaining all contemporaneous records clearly, cleanly, neatly in a way that you can easily retrieve them. Why? Why? Because at project closeout, you're going to have an opportunity to try to resolve this claim on your own. The more orderly you have the, that information, the more readily you have that information, the greater your opportunity to do this without ever employing an attorney, without ever having to call Dan and I other than to say, hey, we've got a potential claim. What recommendation would you have? Um, you're going to preserve profit. You're going to protect profit. All right. And if that doesn't work, you're going to give you're going to give Dan and I a full hand of cards We're the poker table. I want five cards. I don't want two. Dan doesn't, Dan can play with three. I've seen him do it, but he likes to have five cards, right? We like them to be aces. So the better job you do at protecting this, the more likely you are to resolve it on your own. And if it isn't resolved, it helps us get it done. Uh, as I mentioned before, claims are important, not only if you wanna get money, but look, the fact of the matter is this. I, I had a client for years who said, Tony, I don't wanna send notices to my customer that they're delaying me because I feel like I'm a pain in the ass. I, I wanna have this relationship. And I said to that person, uh, person, I'm, I'm not concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is the owner getting angry that this project is gone late, putting blame on your customer. And now your customer turns around out of convenience and says, you know what? Uh, your company was responsible for this. I don't want to have a record. You don't want to have a record of you not saying you're holding me up, you're holding me up, you're holding me up to defend, simply to defend. So by having that discussion with owners and project teams, explaining to them that you don't have to go out and stab somebody with these claims. Sometimes you just have to develop the, the, the framework and the facts so that you can protect yourself. That in and of itself is claim management. Let's go to the next. Here's a point that we already talked about before you do anything, because this is getting a little jabby. This is getting a little sharp stick in the eye. Uh, talk to your upper management, talk to the owners, lay it out. I've done this. I've done everything I can. Our next step is claim. Are you okay with that? Is it, are we right to do that or do we need to find find some other way around this, all right? And, and, and just to, to, to jump in here on this, you're, you're touching on this delicate balance, right? Because everybody wants the next job from the good customer and, and you wanna preserve the relationship. Um, so we get that. So this is, this is it's, it can be uncomfortable to be like, what if, if every time something comes up, I'm sending a notice, I'm not gonna get the next job, which is, which is fair enough. And that's why we don't suggest that you, you beat them over the head with a thousand paper cuts, but there's a way to, it's just like communicating with human beings. There's a way to pre pre present it 
you signed an offensive subcontract that they gave to you. It's their form of subcontract. Blame it on that. Say, look, I'm not trying to create an adversarial relationship, but your contract requires me to tell you when I'm running into an issue. And maybe this allows you to go to the owner because maybe it's the owner or the design professionals. So there's always a way to present it in a way that doesn't look like you're picking a fight. Right, we already talked about that issue. So Dan, why don't you take the next slide on, uh, on notification? Sure, so you have a claim, you know you have one, what, what do you do next? Again, the old adage, it's in your contract, it's going to tell you. Um, chances are it's gonna be very unfriendly and it's going to say, uh, you must tell me in writing within 48 hours of discovering the condition giving rise to your claim you have to tell me what it is. You have to tell me how much it's going to cost. And if you don't, then you give up that claim. It's going to be very harsh and strict language. It's not going to be as friendly as this AIA, which gives you 21 days. It doesn't have words like waiver in it. Um, so assume it's going to be offensive. Uh, 48 hours is not enough time to do anything really on a, on a long, large construction project. So do the best you can. If it says, give, give me notice and backup, you tell them at this time, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the delay. Um, I, I will, you know, I can't quantify the cost. I can't quantify the time, but your contract requires me to tell you about it. And I am committed to providing updates along the way. Maybe it's a nothing burger and it doesn't end up mattering. But the point is, um, if you don't speak up, if you keep it to yourself and don't tell anybody on the other side that you have a claim, then, then you've prejudiced your customer from going up to the owner or trying to deal with it. And that's when you run into issues. And, and just, just quickly here, if your contract says that you have 48 hours and you don't provide the notice within 48 hours, it's now in the third day or fourth day, do it anyways. All right. I've had some people say, oh, you know, I missed that 48 hour time frame. It's an important time frame, but do it anyways, uh, because we'll find more often than not, we'll find a way around it. If you fail to do it, you put yourself in a bad position. Yeah. And the, the other thing about that is in every state's different, but a lot of states are very practical of uh, the courts and the arbitrators about how they deal with notice. They know the reality of a project. So if you're able to demonstrate in, in a lot of states and Pennsylvania is one of them, that you have clearly notified um, the customer, even if it's not quite uh, on time, but you've notified them prior to the end of the job, it, you know, as, as quickly as you reasonably could, and they were made aware of it and they had every opportunity and they weren't really prejudiced to, to deal with the, the claim. Um, it's not bulletproof, but a lot of courts are going to be sensitive to the fact that you really tried your best to comply with the spirit of this of this provision. So let's talk about delays. Um, at its core, a delay is you have a date certain for completing the project um, and you are either past it and performing in an extended period or you know you're about to and there's no way you're gonna complete it on time. So we're talking about performing work in a, you know, for longer than you had forecasted, for longer than it is allowed in the schedule we all know the costs associated with that extended supervision, um, perhaps wage escalation because you're performing work in a, in a new wage period that you that you shouldn't have had to have the job been on time. Um, that's delay. And we're going to ask for time when we know it's coming. Um, and if there's costs associated, we're going to ask for costs. So this is your lengthy standard AIA definition of, of a delay and a claim. And you'll see just like a, it's a claim like any other because you're going to need to give notice within 21 days of the first occurrence. What we often what I'll tell you is what we often see is if it, there's different dates in notice provisions for general claims than there are in uh, delay claims because delays can have such a huge impact on the overall progression of the project. The time frame for providing notice of delay claims is often much, much shorter. So if you have 48 hours to provide notice of a claim, don't be surprised if you have 24 hours to provide notice of a delay. Exactly. Um, so again, that this is, you know, this is notice again, but but 
you see we have questions for the end of each month. And Tony's right. If there's a way to track progress on a weekly basis, uh, you know, that's certainly better. But the reason why we're very focused on the month is because, and we'll get to this when we talk about partial releases, every month you're going to submit an application for payment. And every month your contract is going to say that you need to sign a release that says in exchange for this progress payment, I don't have any liens up through the, the date and the amount that you're paying me, but also I don't have any claims. I don't have delays, I don't have anything. And if you sign that every single month, you're, get, you're allowing the, the, the contractor to build its own record that says, you may have had claims, but every month you were supposed to look at that and tell me about it, but instead you just signed the waiver. So we wanna be asking ourselves at the end of each month, are we following the original schedule? If we're not, whose fault is it? Is it my fault? In which case you want to quickly develop a recovery plan because you're not going to be entitled to recoup time or money for your own delays. Um, is it somebody else? And if it's somebody else, am I telling them? Because it's just like when a tree falls in the woods, right? If I don't, if, it, if, it, if a claim, you know, doesn't have notice, you're, you're not going to have the ability. They're going to treat it like there's no claim. So you have to speak up. And that's, that's where, you know, what should we do about it comes in. Taking appropriate action is putting out the notice. And again, to my point, we don't assume that they know about it. So we have to protect ourselves. We have to speak up in a diplomatic way. You, your contract requires that me to, to put you on notice. I'm going to mitigate it as best as I can. Let's collaborate. We're a team. I'll keep you posted. That type of thing. When it comes to delay claims, um, there's, there's three main buckets and you want to come back to this slide and, and a lot of these slides and use it as your cheat sheet for when you're developing your letters, because this is how courts look at delay. And so if you know how a court looks at delay or how they look at a certain issue, you can craft your letters kind of looking ahead so that when the court or the arbitrator gets it, they're going to say, oh, wow. This is, this is a very, this is a good project manager. They're credible. They protected the record and they said the right things. It's going to buy you credibility and goodwill with the decision maker. So number one is your, is your worst case scenario. It's non excusable because it's your fault. You don't get time and you don't get money. Number two is not a terrible place to be. Um, it's an excusable delay, um, but nobody's responsible. That could be an act of God, a pandemic, um, weather, things like that, where it's nobody's responsibility. And you're probably going to be looking at, you know, maybe the force majeure provision of your contract. And it'll probably say you can get time for this, but not money. Um, money is king. But again, you ask for time because if you ask for time and it's a stadium or a school and you know that the date isn't going to change, you make that request. They say no. Now you've been accelerated and money becomes on, comes on the table again. Um, bucket number three is the place you really wanna be where it's somebody else caused the delay, predecessor trade, um, design flaw, something that the owner drove, but it's, an ex it's excusable and it's not your fault and it's somebody else's fault and you make the request for time and money um, provided you've been impacted by it. Right. Thanks. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to recover a little bit of time here uh, uh, that uh, that Dan and I have caused the delay in the presentation of this of this uh, presentation. We're going to we're going to skip ahead. Um, but here's what here's the here's the purpose of this presentation. It's not only to convey information to you, but we're going to provide a a, 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 um, a PDF of this to Jay, and Jay's going to circulate this to to each of you afterwards. We want to we want this to be in your arsenal so that you can call up this presentation anytime to help you craft the right letters to say the right things, as Dan said. So the next couple of slides, we're just going to skip ahead. But the idea here is that causes of delays can come from anything. We know that. It can be, it can be you. It can be, as Jan said, acts of God. It can come from every angle. Uh, you can advance to the next slide. This is yet another continuation of the list of the potential things that can cause delays. No issues there. Let's go to the next slide. Costs. Uh, we're talking about delays, so you're, you're now performing work longer than you anticipated, right? So this is, these are the types of costs, the categories of costs that you're likely to incur. You may not have them, but these are the ones that you're likely to incur. 
use this slide as a checklist when you go to write that letter to your customer saying, you know, we're being delayed. These are the things that we are suffering right now. These are the additional costs that we have. All right, let's go to the next. So these are the general questions that you and your team should have about delay, right? Uh, yeah, how do you how do you notify your customer delicately and appropriately about delays? And should you notify them? And should you be specific about the areas in which you're delayed? The answer is you got to do it. You got to do it. You got to do it. If you don't, somebody's going to attempt to pin the blame on you. So let's talk. Let's show a gold star, the golden standard of the means to explain and identify delays. This was this is something that we did not construct. This was done by a project manager on a project electrical project a decade ago. But we were so impressed with this uh, that we now use it as uh, in our slideshow. Uh, the project manager knew that the project was being delayed in multiple areas, wasn't able to get access, wasn't able to progress them. So on a daily basis, how about that for, for, uh, for focus and, and action? On a daily basis, he sent this memorandum updated to identify what? To identify to the customer, we're being delayed. These are the activities that are being delayed. These are the locations where those activity in the structure where those activities are being delayed. This is the current status of those delays. And here's a commentary on the comments. What has to be resolved to free these things up, to let us go forward? Sent that out. This, this resulted in a claim that was quickly resolved because of big dollars. It was quickly resolved because we had each of these for a series of months to show to the other side and you can't, you can't defend against that, right? You can't do it. You can't blame the contractor for this. And if we had to get, if we had to get even more involved, you give this to an expert, a schedule expert, they'll have a heyday. They'll crush the other side. You can't, you, you, this, this is the way to do it if you can. Now you don't have to, you can do this on a weekly basis. You can send an email, but the trick is to send a contemporaneous record, meaning a record today of what's going on so that nobody can ever question the accuracy of that information. Don't wait until a claim develops and say, I remember sometime in August of last year that we had some problems. That's not compelling. Let's go to the next slide. So, uh, and I'll, I'll try to uh, accelerate here as well. Um, so uh, real, real life construction issue here. Um, a waiver of a claim is giving up your rights and knowing that you're doing it. So some piece of paper has put been put in front of you whether you realize it or not, because it might be some fine print at the bottom. In this case, we're talking about change orders. A lot of your change orders at the bottom are gonna say, hey, by the way, um, everything under the sun that could possibly relate to this change order, delay, inefficiency, acceleration, you, you're, it's all in here, you're, you're giving it up. And if, if not everything is in there for you, whether it's time or money, then you either can't sign that document as is, um, or you need to you need to send something additional. We recommend trying to revise the language on the change order itself, um, but chances are they're going to say absolutely. I want you to scrub that language. And this is what I mean when I say there's always one more thing that you can do. Write this down. Come back to slide number 27. You can refer back to it. It shows you this is a situation where our client marked up the change order, said this isn't everything, and then. They said, you want the change order, take it off. So we write, you have advised us that the owner won't process the change order with this language. So as a consequence, we're resubmitting it without that language. Nevertheless, this letter is intended to place, fill in the blank, the owner and architect on notice that this change order does not include delays, disruptions and inefficiency. Is it the best possible thing? No, the best thing would be get a revision to the change order. But there's always one more thing that you can do in a diplomatic way. So acceleration quickly is really the flip side of the, it's the other side of the completion date. So here's your completion date. You've gone past it for delay um, and acceleration is you've asked for time, but they're not moving the date. So because of something that got in your way, an impediment, a uh, predecessor trade, you now have to complete the same or more work in a compressed time. And, um, and you've been directed perhaps to do that. So causes can be you, hopefully it's not by a contractor, um, the owner, there's all kinds of causes, but assuming it's not your fault and as the electricians, it's probably not gonna be because you get on after a lot of trades were there, 
then you're going to want to speak up about it. Directed acceleration is, is the preferred way, but it's very unlikely. This is, you've gotten a change order for acceleration. Probably means there's a desperate situation and you have all the bargaining power. Don't count on it, but we've seen it before. It's happened. Th you want to tune into constructive. That's implied acceleration. And as long as you follow these four boxes and you need to follow all four of them, you will have created a record that entitles you to acceleration. So it's a delay that isn't your fault. Your customer, um, you ask, excuse me, for a, a time extension and it's denied. You're told to, to go forward anyway. And then you close the loop by saying, I've been accelerated. I asked for time. You didn't give it. I'm tracking my costs. I'll talk to you about it when, I, uh, when I've quantified them. Costs include overtime, inefficiencies, um, additional supervision because you're adding labor. So you're, you're going to have to have more supervision in there. Hey, back to me. So let's let's talk about um, let's let's talk about a couple of things very quickly here in terms of acceleration. As Dan mentioned before, you got to ask for time, even if you know you're never going to get it. If this is the if this is a football project and the football team's going to be on that field, uh, whether you're done or not, or whether it's a school that's got to open, you got to ask for the time. Your contracts and the law are aligned in that point. You got to do it. Now, let's how do you do that? Let's let's take a look at the next slide. If, you're, if the owner can't give it to you or refuses to give it to you, you're going to send a letter very similar to this. All right? The first paragraph just says, hey, I expected to get this done in a number of weeks, and I can't do that anymore because of delaying events. Uh, the second paragraph is where the meat is. And it says, therefore, we're requesting X number of day extension. And if you fail or refuse to give this, we'll have no choice but to consider this a constructive acceleration and all additional costs that we occur to achieve that compressed date to the extent that we can. And we're gonna track on a daily basis. We're gonna submit it to you. We're gonna seek it as a change order at the end of the project, right? That's sometimes the best that you can do. You provided the notice, you provided an opportunity for the other side to, to extend the date, whether they can or not, you complied with your contract and the law and you go forward. This, this preserves your right. Let's go to the next slide. This, yeah, yeah, this just drives, this is a decision of an arbitrator. So you know how they handle it. Having breached its obligation to compensate with an extension of time, the contractor is liable for damages. You asked for time, time was your only relief. You didn't get it. Therefore, the dollars start to flow. That's how construction arbitrators decide these types of things. Um, that, was, of that was a real decision. That was Dan's decision in a recent yes. case. Okay. I, I, yes, that was another combined cycle power plant, and I, I think it was a $10 million award. So it was, uh, it was good stuff, uh, but hopefully um, doesn't happen to you in the future. Um, lost efficiency, it's, it's a product of delay and acceleration. This is just a, a stark example. Um, you estimated eight hours to excavate, but you got pushed in the winter because of some other delay. Now it takes you 16 hours to, ex to excavate into the frozen ground. That's 100% loss of productivity, and we want to capture that. The causes of inefficiency, out of sequence work, you're, you're, you're pulling, you're coiling, you're going up in the hoist to the next floor, and then you got to come back because the walls weren't ready. Classic inefficiency, that's going to add up. Um, congestion, uh, over time, you know, you know the NECA factors, the morale gets lower, you're working you know, 10 hour shifts, seven days a week, it's, it's murder. So let's talk about how you prove inefficiencies, right? So you're running the project, how are you gonna do that? Um, it's tough as one of our, pro as one of our law partners says, it's like nailing jello to the wall. And I love that expression uh, because it's so apt. You know, how, how easy is that? Um, look, from a project manager or superintendent's view, the way that you're going to try to capture inefficiency costs, you're going to take you're going to take a look at your material costs that you had charted. And you're going to see the excess, and you're going to say the delta, the difference between those two is our, our inefficiency costs. That's what you're likely to do, and to start to drive the dialogue with your customer. What is an expert going to do if this can't get resolved in the field? They're probably going to do a measured mile uh, analysis. They're going to see how well and how uh, you pr you produced how how quickly and efficiently you produce in a period of time that you were not impacted and compare that to a period of time where you were impacted. So what can you do to help yourself and what can you do to help an expert in the future if you can't resolve it? You need to keep them hitting you over the hammer with this great, clear, contemporaneous reports on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. And what does that mean? On your Keep good dailies. 
keep them neat. Don't do this in real life. Don't put in cooking recipes in your dailies. I've seen that. Don't put in sections of uh, the Old and New Testament because it's something that you're preparing for on a Wednesday night. Don't do that. It, all good things, put it in another notepad. It makes you look flaky. It makes you look distracted. You don't want to have that. Keep neat, terse notes. Next slide. Um, correspondence. This is a way that you're going to be able to prove your case and no one's going to be able to point, push you off. If something comes up, send an email. Something, if, you, if something's in your way, take a photograph of it, send an email to your customer. This thing's in my way. If it becomes a progressive thing, go back to that golden star standard and start providing daily or weekly updates as to how your impact. Let's keep going to the next slide. Meeting minutes. They're your friend. They're not often your friend, but they can be your friend in a claim scenario because again, they're taken contemporaneous and they may be taken from your customer and they may have a customer bent, but when you get those meeting minutes, you read them. If there's something that they didn't include that you said, like, hey, we're being impacted, send an email, say, hey, you, you left out that point of us being impacted, please correct that. And it doesn't matter whether your customer corrects it at that point in time, you've taken a contemporaneous step of rejecting the accuracy of those meeting minutes and you've created a record. That's what you need to do. Always look at the meeting minutes, always take the fight to a, an omission or something that is, uh, is wrong. Next slide. So beware, don't be penny wise and dollar foolish. Um, at this point, you've done everything correctly. You've sent the right notices. You've protected the record. Are you done? Hell no. Hell no. Uh, unfortunately, you're not. And that's because the monthly partial release that we talked about. Back in the day, it was all about liens where you get paid, you give up your lien rights. But suits like Tony and I added in things like this. It's not just delays. You're giving up any claims, delay, any interference, inefficiency, acceleration from the beginning of time through the date of this release. So if you start to sign these un, unadulterated, un, unmarked up, this is the waiver we're talking about. You're a sophisticated company and courts are not sympathetic to sophisticated companies who had an opportunity to read a piece of paper and sign it. And that's what we're talking about. So. Um, this is going to be an exhibit to your subcontract. So technically you could negotiate the language up front. Um, don't see that happen too often. So in reality, um, you know, every month, if accounting handles these because it's a money issue, make sure accounting talks to you, the project manager, every month. Do we have claims? Do we have delays? And identify them as best as you can. If you can in mark the, in the document. In the document. If you can mark it up, great. They'll probably tell you, no, 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 this is an exhibit in your contract. You got to sign it as is. And that's when you write the letter that we looked at back on uh, slide 27 or whatever it was, um, where it says, I took it off because you won't give me my money. It's like, it's like the rest. They have a gun to your head. But make no mistake. I have a claim. You still have pending change requests X, Y, and Z, and I'm coming back for them. You've staked out your position in real time and courts will take to that. Um, last topic quickly is everything we just talked about, it's breach of contract, classic breach of contract. So Tony and I are gonna sue the customer for breach of contract, but there's some other nice tools in your arsenal outside of the contract. Payment acts, your lobbyists for, for NECA, for the MNSCA, they've done a really nice job of, of beefing up the Prompt Pay Act, the, the Contractor and Subcontractor Payment Act. Um, for private projects. And it entitles you for late payment to 1% one interest, one interest per month, penalties if they've withheld it without telling you why or giving you a good reason, another 1% per month. And if you have to hire Tony and I to collect undisputed funds and we win in court, they also have to pay your council fees. This is the kind of thing that you can use as a negotiation tool at the end of the project. You don't even have to use it, you know, as part, of, we'll, we'll include it in your lawsuit, but you, it's, it's like you're giving something up. Listen, you, you've owed me this money for six months. I'll give you a break. I won't charge you 12% annual interest and then penalty. So that's the negotiation and it can be a very powerful hammer to level the playing field. Jay, this is the industry hour. We're going to go an industry hour in two minutes. Is that cool? It's fine, guys. Please continue. All right, we're almost there. So we've talked about your customer. 
getting getting money from your customers, Dan just mentioned. Sometimes that customer runs out of money. Sometimes that customer files for bankruptcy. Sometimes that customer moves to Central America. You never see them again, right? So what other ways? Who who has pockets into which you can reach to recover for your work in the event that your customer heads for the hills? Um, and these these are a couple of remedies. Each one of these things that we're going to talk about are their own subjects and could take an, an hour presentation, but we want to sensitize you to the fact that there are other pockets. One are mechanics liens, and you're putting your hand into the pocket of the owner whose property has been improved. If it's a private project, you can do this. If it's a public project that's not purely public, you can do this. You can assert a right to your money uh, from the land itself. This is a technical undertaking. We caution you not to try to do this on your own. You need legal advice uh, to ensure that you do everything in time because if you miss one thing, you're likely to have the court reject your lien claim. And this is a powerful tool. Next slide. Um, this is a little bit of the mechanics of lien claim. Just know that they exist and they need to be pursued uh, quickly. In Pennsylvania, you technically have six months from the time that you last perform your work. Why are you waiting six months? perfect your lien. You never want to do that. And if you're a subcontractor, you have only five months after your last work to provide what's called a notice uh, of intent to lien. Next slide. If you, if, you, if you find yourself in a position where your client or your customers head for the hills and you have to think about filing a lien, contact a, a construction lawyer. Um, payment bonds. Sometimes, sometimes uh, on well, on almost all public projects where you can't lien the project, there's a there's a statutory requirement uh, that a, a general contractor issue a payment bond. So that's another pocket for you to put your hand into, essentially an insurance company. If you can find that bond and you have that bond and you follow the instructions of that bond, you have the right to recover, often have the right to recover uh, for the money that you haven't been paid by your customer who uh, skipped town. The thing is, you need to get that bond and waiting until there's a claim is the wrong time to go asking your customer, hey, by the way, I know that you issued a bond that you personally guaranteed. Can you please give that to me so I can file a claim against it? They're not gonna give it to you. So the best time to get a bond is the beginning of the project. When you're getting their their con their, their proposed contract documents, just, just send them, hey, just say, hey, send me the proposed contract so I can take a look at it. We wanna make sure we're cool. And any and all bonds that are issued on this project. So I can just throw that in my file. That's the best way to get it. Next slide. Right, we're done. That's the hour and two or three minutes. Um, we we will stay on. Dan and I are happy to stay on and ask answer uh, any questions that are there. I'm, we're happy for the participants to drop off. We know you have other commitments. Thank you so much, Jay, for having us. Uh, do know again, we're going to send a copy of the presentation uh, in PDF with some checklists uh, that can be used at the beginning of the project by your supervisory team during and towards the end to help uh, them spot issues and tackle them as they come up. I realize we, we compressed a lot of material there. There's a lot there. Don't hesitate to reach out. These are our direct dials and our email addresses. Don't be a stranger if you ever want to kick things around um, and uh, flesh things out or even ask for, you know, a webinar on or a seminar uh, to your company for certain topics like this. We're happy to drill down in further detail. But mostly, thanks for giving us this hour. And four minutes, and and again, we're we're on we're online still. If you want to ask some live questions, thanks. I have a, I have a question in the chat box here. Uh, it says, "What if a GC tells us to remove delays and impacts from the daily reports?" Ah, I've never seen that. Um, uh, you know what? Uh, I, why would you do it? Um, I guess it, 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 it comes up, there's two issues. Uh, so daily reports are sometimes kept private in the pocket of the supervisor and put away, and nobody ever reads those unless there's a claim. I know there are some larger projects where one of the responsibilities is that daily reports are to be issued either electronically or dropped in a drop box uh, by the project management team. If they tell you to omit that, that in information, I think, I think the practical thing, what I would start off with is, is sending a response and say, why? Um, because what do you what are you going to have them do? They're going to respond to you, and what are they going to tell you? They're going to say, "Well, we don't want our customer to see that," and then the response is, "Why?" Uh, and and that should continue until that goes crazy. And then if you have to decide, I mean, if you if you want as a practical issue to remove it, then you send a similar communication like Dan and I talked about before. You've asked us to remove certain information from the project records, considering you know, this, and we've been including it for certain reasons. Um, we will do that at your request, but we're going to keep a separate copy uh, and we're going to send it to you by electronic email that identifies those issues. Right. 
there's always another way to skin that cat. Um, and you can, you can say, look, we can, do, we can do this any way you want. I can, I can do it. I can send you something every month. I can send you something every day, but your contract requires me to do this. If you want to modify the provision, we can certainly do that. Um, but I don't think you want to do that. I'm just following your lead. Um, and, you know, there's always another thing that you can do, like Tony said. Great. I have another question here. With the rise of material pricing, is there a way to get recouped from commodity increases during the length of a job? Wow. That's timely, Tony. Yeah, that, that person read an article that, uh, or may have read an article that Dan and I published recently. Thanks for the, thanks for the blurb. Yeah, you know, as everybody knows, uh, price of copper itself has doubled over the course of the last year, right? And that's going to put a dent in, in your project, especially those that you bid three years ago and are continuing to work on. Uh, yeah, you've got a couple of things. I mean, we're, we, we could talk about what you do in the future. In the future, when you're setting down and negotiating a contract, you negotiate a, a, a material escalation clause. And uh, if anybody's interested in the article that Dan and I wrote on that, we're happy to send that along as well. Um, but for those ongoing projects, I think what you do is you, you talk to your customer and you say to them, look, we bid this and you should have you should have your takeoffs in hand if necessary to prove it. Uh, say, look, we bid this uh, with a you know, unit price for wire or lineal feet you know, price for wire. It's doubled, um, and we can't. We're losing. We're losing our ass. We can't do that. This is a this is a change caused by um, you know, a pandemic event, uh, and we, we're treating this as a change order. Submitted. Say we're going to submit a change order request. We'd ask you to approve that. Hopefully, that works. Um, it's not guaranteed, but it's the first start, and it's the reasonable start. And should that fail, you know, then you can start looking to other provisions in the contract, such as your force majeure provisions, which generally give you time and not money, but you can look for other ways to try to back in the, the excessive uh, cost. It's a real issue. Um, that's, that's, those are the, cir the circumstances, Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add to that in terms of- No, I mean, yeah, if, if, it's, if it's a project where, where the contract's already negotiated, all, all you can really do is, is find where in your contract the situation is addressed. If it's not expressly addressed, then you're in like a, a claim or a change order territory and you don't get what you don't ask for um, and maybe it leads to something. But the, the future advice is good because if you, it, it gives you the ability to say, look, I can price this at X, which is much lower. If, you will, if you'll just include this provision that says, if my materials exceed by a certain percentage, we're going to have a conversation and renegotiate because if you don't, then my price goes up and your price for all my competitors is going up too. Cause we're all chasing after the same material. So price is King. So if you're, if you're chasing the job, there's a way to present it in a way that's going to make the, the, the contractor look good to the owner. So think of it that how can you help the contractor when you're negotiating this contract? Yep. Excellent points. We got I other questions. Yeah, I, I, I have one actually personally for me. Uh, Nika, as you know, we do a, a lot of foreman training. And part of that foreman training, we talk about the importance of the foreman's daily job log and noting simple things such as the weather or any delays of why you couldn't get in a certain area. What are some ways that, that, that project managers and supers can use that foreman's job log to help make their case when presenting these letters to the GC or the owner? Wow, Dan, you want to you want to do that? Or I can I can jump on. It's your call. Yeah, sure. Look, it, it's it's um it's not much different than the daily reports that Tony was alluding to towards the back end of the presentation. Um, you know, it's handwritten. There's a re it's it's contemporaneous. There's a real authenticity to it, um, and 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 that can be a very useful tool to show what was happening all the way down on the ground. This isn't just some decision that was made at the highest level from somebody who doesn't really know the project, the things I'm telling you happened and you can see it in my foreman's daily journal. So this is where Tony is saying, don't write the Bible passages, don't write the recipes, keep that somewhere else, but use the journal to say, like, this is how many men we have. They're asking us to, to double our manpower. We're running into this issue. Um, we can't we can't finish our work because the walls aren't up. Those types of things in a non-adversarial way, just describing what's happening is going to add that color to that story. 
And that story is important because one thing that I probably should have said during the presentation is that nine times out of 10 as the sub with all the labor risk and you're the last to leave as the electrical, um, chances are you're not causing your own issues. So you're gonna have really good facts and a really sexy story to tell at the arbitration. And your, and your, your customer is gonna have a very one-sided contract that has very real and enforceable defenses. Not very sexy, not a lot of sex appeal. So, so part of the, the, the object here is to let that story and the facts overwhelm the contract because they will, they will be pointing to those technical defenses. And again, they're real, they matter, and we've been teaching you how to get around those. But, but having the journal entry from the, from the bottom up is going to help you weave that, that powerful story that's gonna make the arbitrators or the judge wanna say, I can't toss this claim, this is overwhelming. Hey, Jay, Jay, I just wanna add something towards the tail end. I, look, using psychology is always a great tool when it comes to motivating people in the field. Foremen don't want to keep records. It's the last thing that they want to do. And they don't want to keep good records. I mean, the best of them do, but what are we talking about? 10% maybe? Mm -hmm. So this is, this is what I'd say to the foreman. And it's true. Uh, because I have foremen say to me all the time, why do I need to keep these daily records? They're never read by anybody. They rattle around the back of my truck. And at the end of the project, I throw them away. Well, here's the deal. Uh, if the project goes sideways, um, those foreman records are likely to be the things that are the, they're the golden nuggets of any claim because they're so, as Dan said, they're so pure, they're so granular, they're so in the field, nobody's gonna question that. So you tell your guys, keep good records because if you keep good records, when the close out, they can help us resolve this. And if not, you're going to be witness number one in this lawsuit. And you're gonna be asked a bunch of questions about what was going on in that project. So motivate them, they, their, their own responsibility should motivate them there. The desire not to be in that spot should help help them. Yeah, yeah. and the, the last thing I'll add on to that um, is this may be in the checklist, and if it's not, I'll include it anyway. Um, foremen don't like to write by nature. Um, so, you know, one of my mentors says, okay, how do they like check boxes? So we, we have a form um, that, that we can include in the materials that we send, and it can keep the writing to a minimum um, as well. So you got a bunch of options, but that's great. Tony's point on psychology is a very good one. Scare them, scare them, because nobody wants to be deposed, be a witness. No. Um, and frankly, it's it, you know it's it's usually avoidable. So, good well, question. Guys, I don't see any more questions here in the chat box. Does anyone have any further questions? Well, Anthony and Dan, I, I can't thank you enough for one, participating in our industry hour and two, for taking some time with us this morning to share some of your insights and knowledge to help us protect our bottom lines. It's greatly appreciated. Excellent. Thanks for having us.